All right, everyone ready? Welcome. I'm Jeff Kohler. I am uh, from a company called Anarin, and we're a partner of PIs. And what we basically do is take the uh, wonderful chips that Thomas invents in his group, and we put them in modules, and then we try to make them easy to use. So effectively, what we're doing is we're taking the TI low power RF chips, adding antennas, certifying with organizations like the FCC, and creating modules that can then be used by people who, who uh, simply want to plug in and go, not have to. So if you're Nokia, you're probably not buying something from me. You've got your own RF engineers. You've got your own you know, RF design capabilities. But if you're somebody who's using a microcontroller trying to worry about the Internet of Things, then what we're trying to do is to make it easy for you to do that. Today, we make a variety of different modules based on many of the chips that Thomas just talked about. But uh, today, what I want to focus on is, is our Bluetooth low energy one. Uh, it is, um, Thomas was talking about coin cell. It's the coin cell kind of a solution possibility. And what it does, it gets for glamorousness, is we're going to talk about how it's going to make it easy to connect up your machine, whatever it is you're designing or, or, or that you have, to you know an iPhone or an iPad without having to become either A, a protocol stack expert, or B, an RF expert. That's really what we're doing. Um, let me just skip. This is one slide I left in there, but it doesn't belong in here. So just to give one brief slide on company here, um, we, Anarin, we're a 45-year-old or so company. We've been RF business our whole you know, lives. We manufacture about 140 million RF components. So we're a you know, major manufacturer. And, and, uh, and we're partnered with a company called Emico, who's doing some of this software together. So we're basically making these RF modules, and Emico is doing this, the software that I'm going to talk about today. So the combination of the two, and TI is underneath everything here as making the chips that it's all running on. So what's the problem that we saw that we're trying to solve here is there are lots of machines in the world and they all have control panels of some time type. Some of them are old, some of them are new, but they're all A, in your machine typically, B, they're fairly rigid, meaning they do what they do and they're not easy to change. And so we kind of foresaw that and said, what if we could take these incredible, you know, devices that we all walk around with and think of as, you know, we just deserve these now when years ago you wouldn't even, you know, ten years ago they didn't even exist. So what if we have our control panel in our pocket already? How can we do that? And 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 so that will uh, be kind of what we're looking at here. It what does it give you? It gives it that every he has it. You don't have to put it in the machine necessarily. You can have black boxes. Uh, it gives you a software-based control panel. So if you decide, oh my God, I've forgotten. I need a new meter or I need a new button. You add a new meter. You add a new button. This doesn't change your device. Your embedded device, your your machine, as I like to call it, stays exactly the same. I'll give a very brief, I'm not going to go into the details of the technology very much. We can go, by the way, you know, we're, Joe and I are talking here for a while, and then when our talks get done, if people want to play hands-on, we'll, we're going to go out. There's another room over by the men's room here, kind of a cafeteria. We'll go in. People are welcome to come there and put hands-on. Um, so Bluetooth Low Energy, it's, it is not Bluetooth. This is, you know, what's the ad that used to say, you're not your father's Oldsmobile. This is not, well, this is not two years ago, it's Bluetooth, you know, kind of Bluetooth. Things move faster nowadays. But uh, Bluetooth Low Energy is a new technology specifically focused on ultra low power and small data, right? So this is not streaming video, it's not streaming audio, it's not headsets. This is sensor data. This is the Internet of Things data. I'm going to measure the temperature once a second, ten times a second, once a minute, but you're talking about kilobits of data, not megabits of data. Um, it, it was specifically designed so that the peripherals, and in Bluetooth Low Energy Talk there are peripherals and there's centrals. The peripherals can basically be dead asleep for as long as you want to be dead asleep. 
and when they wake up, they can talk. And so there's no, there's no like the way Wi-Fi does, where it's always got to be online and, and beaconing and doing things like that. None of that. So it is designed to be in devices that are energy harvesting, like Thomas was talking about, designed to be running on coin cells for years. And of course, we all say that's easy to do. It does still take your figuring out how to make sure that you don't ever turn things on, right? The beauty of running off a of coin cells, you have to have a device that basically does nothing almost all the time. Um, but that can be done with Bluetooth Low Energy. So we use this app, and I've got it running here, and we'll run it more, but as a proxy for you know, a control panel for a machine. Now, in the case of what we're really doing here, this is the machine. This is a TI MSP430 microcontroller which is the bottom board here in this pack, connected. The top board is our development board that has our module on it. Um, the, what, the, what this machine does is it blinks an LED. Very complicated task, but it's a proxy for what any, what any um, uh, you know, device would do. What can we do with this, you know, sort of, to give you an idea is, um, so there's the little board, and here's the idea. So first of all, when you're using Bluetooth Low Energy, the control panel doesn't have to be there all the time. I can shut this off. Machine's going to stay running. It loses its connection. It knows that it's not connected anymore, but it has its job to do. This is not telling it in the. This is not hardware in the loop. This is just setting parameters, set you know reading status, that sort of stuff. This goes away. The machine stays happy. So we're going to be able to connect to it. We're going to be able to monitor it so when you see this green going green blank and if you can't you can't possibly see that from where you are but it's actually making the green light that's going on the board here that message is being sent in real time by the device to the to the phone uh, to the iPad so the iPad is not asking what's your status what's your status what's your status this is a case where the device says I know I'm connected to an iPad I'm going to tell them what my status is. Um, we're also going to be able to control it. So, and again, it's, it's easier to see up there. There's an on-off switch. There's a couple of dials and numbers that you can change so you can set parameters. So these are the kinds of things that you want to do when you're connected to a device. I want to monitor it. I want to control it. So we've thrown a few of these in. If you know. An airplane cockpit is a lot more complex than this, but many, 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 and there's nothing limiting Bluetooth to only being three or four things. It's just this is a typical sort of a machine uh, that we're going to talk about here. And, of course, if we can control it, we can adjust parameters. That's kind of redundant there. So one, I'm going to talk about this. This is, this is our abstraction here. So what we tried to do is to say, what are the things that a, that a mobile control would need to do to a device? Do we want to tie it into the specifics of Bluetooth? The lights are washing out the screen up there. Oh. Um, can, you, can you turn off this, this bank? Maybe this bank here probably would clean that out. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That, that better? So, so we don't want you to have to become an RF expert. That's why we make modules. We also don't think you need to become a Bluetooth low energy stack expert to use Bluetooth. What you really want to do in an application is to move data back and forth, right? So we call it our application schema, and this is the one for this Blinker app that describes the data that needs to be communicated between the mobile and the, um, and the embedded device. And it's very simple, and this is quite typical. Um, what you can see up here is uh, it, it's basically going to specify the data type. So is this, is this an on-off switch, an enumerated type? That has two positions? Is it an integer? Is it, it's going to specify the uh, access type, meaning is this a read-only? So for example, if, if you have a push-button on-off switch, that's really write-only. You don't get to ask what position it's in. It doesn't have a position, right? Its position is not being touched right now. But, but if you have a, uh, a thermometer, you can read its temperature, but you can't set its temperature. If you have a thermostat, you can set the set point and read. The, so, you, so you can have 
read-write read write data, read-only data, write-only data, and we also have a couple of others like the one here at the bottom called indicator, which is asynchronous. In the, in the, in the normal mode of, of operation, the device, the peripheral, doesn't do anything that the, that the uh, control panel doesn't ask it to. So if I don't touch with the finger, it doesn't do anything. In the case of an indicator, that's where you set up and say, this is something that the device can send to the control panel even when he's not asking. So effectively an asynchronous event. So a short one page like this is going to specify uh, everything that needs to be known about how to get this application to run. You'll notice there's no mention of Bluetooth in here. There's no mention of you know what frequency it's on. There's no mention of how do I get the message from point A to point B. That's all handled by our software. So, so once you've written this, this becomes, I think it says it here. Oh, a f now, in the puzzle of how do I do this, what do I have here that I'm showing? I've got an iOS app. You know, you're going to have to write an iOS app that looks the pretty way that you want your iOS app to work, right? You've got your machine that's going to be doing the things that your machine does punching holes in paper, you know, measuring temperature, whatever your machine does. Um, what we've specified here in the schema is the communications that goes on between the two. And that schema is enough of a contract, you know, it's everything that it needs to be known, so that all the other development now that needs to happen. So if you need to have a, an iOS app developer developing your iOS app, You've got your embedded developer developing your embedded app. You may already have that part, right? A lot of people, this is a retrofit, adding Bluetooth to an existing device. Um, and, and you've got a hardware designer that's going to ultimately design our little module into there. Um, those three phases can all be going on in parallel because this schema tells everything that needs to be known to them. So that's it's an important, it's a simple thing, but it's an important thing in the sense that once you've figured out what you need your interface to be, everything else can go on from there. Now, I'm going to show, I think it's the next slide here. Okay, so I want to talk about this a little bit, which is kind of, now how does all this come together? We've got a, you know, a fairly short time. I'm not going to be able to make you experts, but I want to kind of fly over 10,000 feet, all, all of the phases of what's going to go on. So at the, at the core to all this, we have a portal up in the sky, up in the, up in the cloud. Um, we call it mHub. That's used really to communicate between the embedded developer and the iOS developer. It's not used by the embedded device during its operations. That's, that's an important distinction that I, I should have mentioned before about Bluetooth low energy versus some other technology. So there was a lot of talk earlier about privacy and, and, and you know, how much do we want. So, and, and this is not right versus wrong. This is two ways of doing things. The, the Bluetooth low energy method is, the, is we're in the room. This is not going through. The, this control between here and here is going from here to here. It's not, there's no cloud involved in the control itself. Now, if you want to have a gateway and accept messages from a gateway and have cloud involvement, you can. But the Bluetooth low energy is not like, you know, what, what Thomas was showing before was it was there was stuff coming from the cloud through his gateway into his device. His device was also communicating with the gateway right in this room. But Bluetooth low energy is an in-the-room technology, so you're not having to worry about, you know, what if someone hacks my refrigerator if it's a Bluetooth low energy thing. You still can have that remote control, but you're not going to have it from the office. You won't be able to turn the Bluetooth low energy without a gateway, which you can have gateways, but it's normally, it's more thought of like it's a, it's a control where you're in the room or in the vicinity, not a control where you're, where you're uh, coming down through the cloud. So this, and it's kind of small to see here because we've got a lot on this one slide, but this is the little development kit. So the idea is we get started, we have a little development kit. It has a microcontroller. It has the, the Bluetooth module in there. It all comes, and we're, we use this to get you started. So it's, it's a known good platform. This may not be the final microcontroller that you're going to use. In fact, it probably isn't. 
this is kind of a very simple MSP430. When you're really designing something, you're going to use a fancier MSP430 than this in all likelihood. Um, but the idea is this gives you a known good experience to learn the tools, to learn how it all works, and then you write, you write your schema. So we talked about the schema. So for your device, you write a schema. You then take code that's needed in your embedded device to do all the communications. So everything that, that, that it needs to do, it knows from the schema. It generates all that code. So that turns out to be about, and, and, and just to give you some numbers, because Thomas was talking about the, uh, you know, the six low pan, this is smaller, you know, this, this is a couple of K, one or two K <laughs> of code that's going to be generated here, that's going to be all that's needed to run this. Because what we've done is we put the entire Bluetooth stack is in our module. So the only thing that's going into your microcontroller in your machine is the interface code to talk to that module. So it, it turns out to be in the 1 to 2K region, there is some variability depending on how big is your schema, how many things do you need to do. Um, we then take, and this, this picture kind of shows it, the, the, um, the M builder, it generates the C code, which is the green block there. You add it into your main.c. So that's what I'm saying is that's your application. Right? We haven't written your application for you. We've given you some communications uh, uh, routines that you can now use. At the same time, what it does is it uploads that schema, and just the schema, not your application. It uploads that schema to the mHub portal in the cloud. That mHub portal in the cloud is going to allow two things to happen. One, the iPhone developer to get access to that so that he can get his development going on at the same time. And two, it's going to let you uh, run what effectively is the debugger, which is a, um, I'll be able to show you that a little bit here too, so, because we have a, a, when you're trying to do the concurrent development, I've got an iOS guy, he doesn't have hardware yet, right, so how does he do develop without hardware? He does that using this little kit. So we take this little kit, we load the schema on there, we fill in the stubs with basically some, you know, if it's a thermo thermometer, just return that it's 23 degrees. You don't actually have to have a thermometer for this guy to write his thing. So you write some very generic stub code effectively in here, and this is the device that he uses before he has his real device. Now, what about the embedded developer before he has this shiny application? We have M Browser, which is, by knowing your schema, can present you the data, not in a shiny way. It's going to be a table of data, but you can interact with it. You can read it, you can write it, you can change it. The data is there, and that's all enabled from this schema and using this mHub portal as, as the kind of the go-between during development. Once you're done with development, there's no need for either end of the application to go to mHub if they don't want to. So in other words, this app right here can be talking to my device. No, nope. I mean, it happens to be connected, so you have to trust me on that. There is no need. It's not talking to the cloud to do anything right now. There's no, there's no requirement at, at all for cloud connection once you're done with the development. So that's kind of step one, which is develop your schema, generate the C code, start working on the embedded development. Step two is and you've learned the tools at this point. Step two that we've got in here is, what is your real microcontroller? So we don't want, if you've been using a microcontroller for the last 20 years and you have all the tools and, and, you, and you love those tools, you don't have to change any of that. The total interface between the, um, I think I've got one in here. The total interface between the, um, between the module and the microcontroller is four wires. So, you know, we provide a little cable here that hooks onto our dev board that can hook up to any microcontroller that you're going to use. So, step two is you're going to have, if you're using the uh, 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 a fancier microcontroller, you might have a, 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 a 
TI MSP430 5529 experimenter board that you want to use. You just take this cable, you connect. So that's step two. That didn't change any of your software. It just changed. So now you're able to develop right on the on the um, on the microcontroller that you're used to, and using the tools that you're used to. That that's even uh, to me almost more important. Uh, and and what does it require? It does require that you be able to take RC and add it in. So you got to have. You know, if you had a microcontroller that you were already 99% full and it had three words left of flash, no, that's not going to work. But if you can add in that one or two K into there, connect up one serial port with two GPIOs, so two wire serial port and two GPIOs, add in the one K or two K of code and compile it in C. And it's very generic C that we generate. It's, it's, it's not, doesn't require any fancy C feature. So that's step two, and that is going on in parallel with what I'm going to call step three. So they really should be 2A, 2B, and 2C, but step, step three is the mobile developer. All he needs to know is the schema. We give that, That's available from the M Hub, and he's now generating things that are going to be using our APIs at the, at the iOS level, let's call it. So he's generating APIs that are saying, you know, put and get resources from the iOS level based on the schema at the, in this, much the same way that the embedded developer is, gener is, is using put and get APIs uh, in the, um, in the uh, embedded world. And then step four here, which is the, the, the little modules here shown at the, uh, the bottom is the hardware designer is, you know, you're not designing this whole red board into your system. What you're designing is the thing that's about the size of you know, my fingernail here, it's 11 by 19 millimeters. That's the piece that goes into your actual system connected by the four wires. So, so the hardware designer is working at the same time doing his job. Now, I'll show you some, I thought I'd show you some, let's see how we do it. I thought I'd show you some actual uh, code and a few things like that just so you can see some of this really happening. And we've got our tab line embedded to mobile, you know, mobile in 90 days. So meaning that this is a very simple process in general. We, we, there, there are a few pieces involved. There's a, there's a HAL involved, that, which is hardware abstraction. We provide that for many, many, most microcontrollers. Um, there is a, um, the schema involved. There's our M-Builder tools involved. We have those. And then you've got your own tools. And then connecting up hardware-wise is a very straightforward thing. So let me show you a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to go to a different uh, different thing here right now. So I'm going to let me see if this works. <coughs> anyway, I got over here. This work? That work? Yeah, it's pretty good. It's not perfect. Let me let me just make it. Uh, That's better. So this is the M Builder tool set. It's an Eclipse IDE. This is not intended to be your IDE that you use for all your development. You've probably got a tool set for your. This doesn't include debuggers and stuff like that. It, but it does include our M Builder, which is the tool that's going to take the schema and generate the code. So if we look at, um, I'm going to open up this Blinker project and show the schema here. How's that look? Okay, so we can see that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, so we can see the schema here. We then would take that schema and run it through the M Builder tools. And you can do that, you know, simply by saying build schema here. There's, there's many ways to push these buttons, but and and uh, and now I want to show you this a little bit. So it went ahead, and I, I'm not sure if I'm online here. Let me see if I am. I am. Okay. 
So can't really see this, but in the in the in the <coughs> green console window here, the thing to note is I built the schema. As a result of that, it did do the HTTP up to the cloud, so it uploaded to the cloud, and the schema is assigned a hash code. That hash code is 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 based on the schema. So that, that is really how schemas are located, is more by their hash code than by their name. But anyway, from there, it generated everything in this folder here called, and here is the, um, the code that was automatically generated. And I'm not going to walk you through it, but just to give you an idea, connecting and disconnecting, and here is... Um, in the schema, it declared that there was an on-off switch named CMD, and he had two states, and there are his two states, blinker start command and blinker stop command, and they pound define into a zero and a one. Um, I'm going to show, what I want to show you here, though, most important is this file right here. So as a result of the schema saying I have these four pieces of data, the only thing that you have to fill in as an application developer are these stubs. So what does that mean? Is you don't have to worry about how you we say that our generated code will automatically call back your application when it needs something. So if I am on the if I'm on the iPad here, which decided to go off, but anyway, if I'm on the iPad here and uh, come on. They, 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 they have their issues sometimes. Come on now, where is it? Uh, you know, <laughs> there it is. Okay, took it a minute. If, if I'm on the app and I click the stop button, what's that going to do? That's going to have the I, iPad here is going to send a message over the air that's going to be received by our module. The module, using code that you didn't write, receives the message. The module using code that you didn't write hands that message to the microcontroller that's your microcontroller in our generated code. Then our generated code is going to call a routine that's called uh, um, store command right here. I, I have this type big so it shows up on the screen, but it's going to call this routine right here, store command. Now what we don't know is what that means. You didn't tell us what it means to store a stop command. I mean, we can all guess what it means, but but in terms of our code generator, so you have to fill in this routine, this stub. You have to fill in. So what does that mean? You might have to turn off your motor, turn on your lights, turn off your lights. Whatever it is you're going to do, you would do in this routine because it's got, you can be guaranteed that it will be called whenever he pushes the stop button. So what we boil down is that the interface becomes... For each control, there's basically, it's not always, if it's read-only, write-only, but for each control, the simplified version of the story is, there's a fetch routine and a store routine that the that can be, that, that you would fill in. If that requires reading from the A to D converters, that's, you know, that's the simple thing to do. So, so that, that is all generated by us. You fill in those stubs, you add, you add our code, plus the filled in stubs to your application and you're up and running. It's, it's really kind of that simple. Um, I just want to look here at uh, one more thing. I want to show you one more thing. There are there are two advanced topics, but it have more to do with the asynchronous events that I'm I'm I'm, I'm not really going to mention. But the thing to note, one thing it's, it's a characteristic of Bluetooth that we can take advantage of is you can see a connection in Bluetooth is a point-to-point -point thing, but a scanner, the, the, the iPhone, can say how many, like if we all had, um, uh, you know, these machines sitting at our desks here, this could see all 50 of them. So the connection is point to point, but the scanning can see everything. So you can, as a device, you can advertise 
And so we have ways that you can take advantage of that. So when you add, so the way a Bluetooth low power peripheral works is it's asleep 99% of the time, just dead, dead to the world. It wakes up, it reads its temperature, it can then advertise and say, hey, I am available and I would like someone, someone to either A, connect to me and, and do something, or B, just read my advertisement. And you can put data in the advertisement as well. So if all you need to tell the world is, I'm OK, you don't even have to ever be connected to. You can just wake up, advertise, wait you know, a second or two, assume that someone's seen you. Uh, and then go back to sleep. So we can control that as well. I'm not going to demonstrate that here now because we've got a you know, short enough time. Um, and I want to show you, I'll just show you the main, the main program here just to give you an idea about that. Uh, here we go. So this is, in, in, for this Blinker program, this is your application, right? This is the proxy of your application. What did, what did it have to do? We have a HAL, which basically defines all the hardware-specific interactions. So you probably have one in your machine. We add a few things because we we're going to control a serial port that's going to have an interrupt. We're going to have a couple of GPIOs, one of them with interrupts. So we're going to have a couple of interrupt service routines in the HAL, serial port interface in the HAL. But it, it's, again, it's a small thing. So you initialize things. In this particular case of this Blinker app, and this has nothing to do with us in particular, it's got a tick timer that's going to wake up every 100 milliseconds and change the light if it needs to. Uh, that's really not us. The only two lines here that really have to do with us are the HAL in it, which is in it your various features, and Blinker start. So the only thing, so you had to fill in the stubs, add these two lines to your main loop, wherever that is, and 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 uh, and you're off and running. So it can be very quick and very simple to get this integrated into your system. Okay, and then I'll just tell you about, so, so the way that you get started with something like this is, and we're going to be giving a bunch of these away here, Kathy is, 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 uh, is collecting everybody's information. So um, we, we have, it's really a two-piece kit, piece one and piece two. So piece one is called the launch pad. It's from TI. TI makes it. It has the MSP430. This particular launch pad has the MSP430 G2553 microcontroller on it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a 16 megahertz, 16 bit microcontroller, very low power, very low cost. This is a sub $1 microcontroller. Um, then we connect that up with the board that we make, which is our booster pack that goes on the launch pad. And and uh, and then these two things put together. So we're giving away a bunch of launch pads and a bunch of uh, booster packs here. For the um, for the for the booster packs, what I've done is I've taken and I've put the the launch pad in there, loaded it up with the Blinker program. You can download from from um, uh, the Apple App Store. So today we run with the Apple devices. So you can go to the Apple Apps, App Store and download mBlinker. And this presentation, I've got it up on a GitHub that I'll, you know, it'll, it'll be available. So you can download all this presentation material and everything already. Uh, it's all up there. But anyway, so you download the mBlinker application. You plug this board if you get one of the dual pairs. Not everybody's going to get a dual pair. I apologize, but if you get the dual pair, uh, then then you can plug it into USB. It's just using USB for power. That's all it's using the USB for in this case. Uh, plug it into USB, it will immediately start blinking, download the free app, and you'll be controlling Blinker without having to do anything. Then you can download the software. We'll talk, you know, we can talk about that later, but you can download the software. You can actually try and edit, you know, you can say, hey, do I really believe this? I'll go change the blink rate in the program and see that it changes, that sort of thing. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Do we want to do that now, Kathy, or are we waiting? Are you done? I'm, I'm I think that's pretty well. I'll give out the well, well. Let me put this up here so people can see. And it's too long to copy down, I think, but I'll tell you what it is. If you go to 
to um, this is on my cover page. I had it. I think we're good. I was trying. I got five minutes for questions. So that's yes. I, that's what I was trying to leave here. Let me just put this slide up on the screen for a second. If anyone wants to copy this down, and you, you could, you, if you, the shortest thing to copy down is my email address. <laughs> if you want, send me emails, call me, whatever you'd like. The GitHub address in blue at the bottom is where all this stuff is located. Um, so all the presentations that I just showed are, are there. And then from there, there's more to download. You download from Anahub, that sort of thing. So uh, questions? You mentioned uh, you have to do an RFID thing. We don't do RFID. Uh, we do uh, 900. The, Thomas was talking about 900 megahertz modules. We have uh, Zigbee modules, six low pan. The Zigbee module can also run the six low pan that Thomas was talking about. Um, uh, we, and we have these blue BLE modules. And there are a few variations on the theme in there, but that, that's the basic three groups are 900, the Zigbee, slash 802.15.4, slash six low pan, and the, and the, uh, and the Bluetooth low energy. The guy. TI, do, TI does make RFID chips, but we haven't made them into modules. That that hasn't. Okay, my, my question was actually, actually had to do with the. Uh, <coughs> so I have an, I, I have an, I, 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 I have an application on a Samsung phone. Yeah. And uh, they said I want tagging potentially uh, uh, with tens of thousands of legs. So the tags are actually uh, pending for tags. Yeah, Tom is probably best to address that. You know. Yeah, I'm thinking of an application uh, for uh, tracking uh, stuff I own at home. It's not the elite rates, but that's, a, that's have it, uh, you have it outside of course. That's what you're doing. OK. I'll continue with the elite. Yeah. OK. Can I run this from an Android phone? Soon. In development. Today, you know. Today in production available is iOS devices only. We'll have the Android soon, but not yet. I think the last question. Is there any kind of encryption or authentication for the hacker from hijacking the signal? Yes, there is. I didn't show any of that, but it has the AE, I believe it's 128 bit AES, so, you know. Can't be hacked by me, but the, the NSA can certainly be reading it. So, if you're trying to prevent the NSA, no. If, if you're trying to prevent, you know, malicious hackers who are less sophisticated, yes. And don't forget, it is sort of an in-the-room technology. So, you know, they, they have to be nearby. So, but there is pairing capabilities. There's all those features are there, so that if you had ten machines in the room you would not be randomly deciding which one you were controlling. You'd say, I want to control machine number 27. And it would, it would, you can repair that permanently, semi-permanently, however you want to set it up. You can control access. You know, I, I want only Joe and me to have access to these devices. So you, you, that's all available. In your, that would be effectively part of your system design more than it is. The features are there supported in the module and in the software. But your system design would decide how to use it. What's the current it's When it's asleep, it's less than a microamp. You know, it doesn't measure on a, like on my meter, I can't see anything. When it's transmitting, there's two answers to that question. It, the lowest number is transmitting and receiving about 14 milliamps. There, if in order to do that, it runs at 2.1. We have a we have a, a DC to DC converter built into the module, and it runs the thing at 2.1. If you run it at the full 3.3, it's a 3. Point, then it would draw about 18 milliamps. So you have that choice, and there's when you start doing the hardware design, there are ramifications to either choice. Generally, people do run it at the 14. So you have two different. There's a pin that tells it whether to use the DC to DC or to bypass it. So there's an input pin. If you run it 2.1, now you just have to worry about when I'm connecting to the UART connection. I'm a 2.1. I can't connect to a 3.3 directly. So you, you have to put some level shifters in there on the UART to do that. That's that's option number one that most people do is is they you know they've got their 
we can actually power the microcontroller from our device. So there's, there's, this, it's a deeper question. But the, the, the answer is the best number is 14, 14, and and the easiest number is 18, 18. <laughs> Maybe just one last question, and then we'll wrap. Uh, does this require Windows to uh, run the development software? Um, it runs on Windows or on OS X, and there's command line versions that would run on, like I run it on Linux sometimes. So the answer is, no, not really. You get, it's Eclipse. We we don't have the Eclipse on Linux yet, but we've got command line tools on Linux today, Mac OS and and uh, OS X and and uh, Windows today. Is it generated code free of any license? It is. It, it's uh, it, there's no fees. It's licensed only that it's got to be used with our hardware. That's great. Nice round of applause for Jeff. Thanks.